Okay, hello internet. If I did this correctly and if the YouTubes are working tonight, then we should be live now on our Theory 11 live event in collaboration with the SAM, Society of American Magicians, uh, for September. We've done this a few months prior, I think about two to three months uh, thus far with a different panel on each of these events. Uh, before I get to the panel for this event specifically, I wanted to talk about the purpose of why we do these things. Why are we doing this at all? Besides, uh, I've got nothing else to do right now. Uh, and the real purpose was a conversation between myself and Vinnie Grasso. Vinnie Grasso is national president at the SAM. He's uh, in the little Brady Bunch display you probably are seeing here. Um, he's the one with the shiniest head that is uh, <laughs> on there. And uh, Vinnie Grasso was, uh, we were talking about the history and tradition of the SAM. And the SAM historically has revolved around group meetings and call them whatever you wish, gatherings, um, whatever, meet, group meetings, uh, ring meetings, whatever various organizations have called them. But it's revolved around the concept of bringing magicians together. And that was the point of this. And so we thought, well, how do we bring that to the new generation of magicians, of uh, people of the next generation? And the internet was the clear answer. So we pulled together a bunch of our friends and we started doing these live panels every month on the 11th. And this is this month's panel. Um, we've got a few special guests that might be coming later, but for right now, we have Mr. Brian Brushwoods. Uh, Hello. And he's sipping something that may or may not be alcoholic, but uh, it says this coffee. is uh, this this is um, be, uh, chicken bouillon. It's like uh, like chicken soup for the for the magician idiot. So. There you go. <laughs> You should write that on the package. I think that's what it's called. To the right of Brian, we have uh, Mr. Jason England. Hello. Jason's, Jason's broadcasting from an undisclosed location known only to the NSA in a bunker in Las Vegas. <laughs> and uh, and uh, lastly, right here to my right, uh, at least in my screen, is Vinnie Grasso, who, as I just mentioned, with the SAM, amongst many other things, he's a magician, he's an author, he's a production manager to various uh, actual stage and touring show productions. And, uh, and that kind of brings me to why we have this group together. This is a very eclectic panel that we have tonight of various different you know, types of magic and styles and experiences in magic, from Jason England to uh, Brian Brushwood uh, doing various things to, to Vinnie Grasso and the SAM. So it's cool to bring together this wide of a spectrum of magicians from across the world. Um, and uh, that's what we're here to do. So I want to get started. Um, with some easy questions uh, that are interesting because I wanted to get the perspective of everyone in this panel. So first and foremost to Brian Brushwood and then Jason if you can follow. How did you get started in magic and why do you do this? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I, I had a passing interest in magic as a kid, which I think a lot of us did. Some of you guys stuck with it. I did not. It wasn't until I went to college and someone showed me a car ticket and wouldn't tell me how it was done. And then all of a sudden, like just out of spite, I was like, well, I'll show you, jerk. I'm going to learn better tricks than you ever did. And so I started on Royal Road to Card Magic, always thinking that magic would just be a side gig. I never in a million years thought it would be a full-time job. But, uh, but by the time I graduated, I had a decent little show, and it sort of just grew from there. I don't know. Did that answer the question? Yeah. Well, I'm specifically uh, elaborate on the when you started shows. So what was that process of starting actually performing? Uh, did, was, that a, was that a goal of yours? How did you start in your kind of college? I, I got stuff? kind of bullied into my first paying gig where uh, I, I was doing some magic tricks for free at a um, uh, like on the quad on campus uh, for, as part of an event happening. And somebody who was a professional magician was like, hey, these are great. You got five good tricks. Uh, I can't make my uh, regular gig at, uh, at the steakhouse this Sunday. How about you? Wait, we'll pay you $40 to do your card tricks. And so, uh, you know, to me, it was the biggest thing on planet Earth. Um, so I kind of got bullied into it. I would never have made that step on my own. But over that next year, I did, you know, just two or three little shows on the side. And then when I came, when we, when it was summertime and it was time to, to go back home, uh, I talked to my friend Gordon, the same guy who showed me a trick and wouldn't tell me I was done. And I was like, Hey man, uh, we know some good tricks. And from what I understand, we could do like better than minimum wage by doing table hopping at restaurants. And, you know, we, we didn't have anyone to tell us no. We didn't have anyone to uh, explain to us how the business works or any of that stuff. So we just put on our Sunday best uh, suits and went to like 30 different restaurants and just met with the uh, manager and basically said, hey, uh, sometimes you get people 
people in lines. I could show them card tricks or while they're waiting for their meals and it won't cost you hardly anything. And as a matter of sheer numbers, looking back on it, we were terrible salespeople. But between the two of us, we got three regular gigs and that defined our summer. All of a sudden, you know, we had this, all of a sudden we were working out material and we were using the money we made from these restaurant gigs to buy actual proper props and, and learning, you know, the, the, all the staples of close up magic. Um, but it's that initial, it's that initial fact that nobody was there to tell us that it can't be done or, or, or it sucked in many ways that we didn't have any guides to usher us into this, this business. But on the other hand, we took some crazy risks that I don't know that we would have done if we had, had started kind of inside the, uh, uh under somebody's wing. Um, Jason, what was your background? What was your story of starting in magic? When was it, and what inspired you to get into magic? As a, as a, I guess when when things started, and what's inspired you to keep doing and do what you do today? Um, well, I make a distinction between when I first enjoyed magic and when I first started um, learning it myself. So, uh, as a uh, as a as a very, very young child, I'm talking uh, six, seven, eight years old, this would have been, uh, I would have been six in 1977, uh, you know, seven, eight, and um, 78 and 79. Um, I loved the Johnny Carson show. Um, and partially because when I would spend summers with my grandmother, uh, didn't have to go to school the next day, she would let me stay up and watch Johnny. And uh, as most of you know, Johnny uh, was a magician always enjoyed magicians, had them on the show regularly. And so I saw, my, my earliest magic memory is uh, I actually wasn't with my grandmother. I was at home, and it was during the school year. So I should have been upstairs asleep. But just like some scene out of a movie, uh, I knew my dad was downstairs watching Johnny Carson. So I tiptoed halfway down the stairs, and I'm sort of peeking through the banister trying to get a look at the television screen in the living room just so I could watch Johnny Carson at, you know, uh, eight years old. I'm supposed to be going to second grade the next morning or whatever. And uh, my dad's nobody's fool. He heard me moving around up there. Um, so he said, hey, you know, you're supposed to be in bed, but why don't you come down here and watch this? I think you'll like this. So that was like an awesome invitation to come downstairs at, you know, 11, 15 or so at night when I should have been long asleep. I ran down the stairs, and I walked in there, and I said, what is it? And he said, just watch. I think you'll like this. And it was a magician. Uh, I cannot tell you who it was because I don't know, uh, but all I remember, and uh, I know our memories are very malleable, but I distinctly remember hands and playing cards and I think I remember aces, but I could be wrong about that. That could be something I inserted into that memory later. But I remember seeing a magician on the Carson show uh, before I was really old enough to understand what magic was. And so I always liked magic from, from that point on. And when I was probably 19, a magic show opened, a magic shop, I'm sorry, opened up in my hometown. And I just kind of wandered in off the street one day. I saw the, the name of the place was Eddie's Trick Shop. They were based out of Atlanta. In fact, I think they may still have a, an Eddie's Trick Shop in Atlanta. I've I don't there. know. I've, I've been there. I remember it was, there at least was um, when I was growing up. And so uh, there was an Eddie's Trick Shop, uh, almost like a franchise, uh, because they had four or five stores around the southeast in, that opened in Knoxville. So I went in there one day, didn't know the first thing about magic other than in my head, I had liked it ever since I was a kid. And I think when I was 11, I saw David Copperfield, 11 or 12 years old. Um, so, you know, I'm a fan of magic, but I have no real outlets for learning it. Uh, I don't know why the public library never really occurred to me, but it didn't for whatever reason. And so uh, when the magic shop opened, I just sort of wandered in off the street and talked to the guy behind the counter, uh, whose name was John. He was the owner. He was also a school teacher. He showed me everything they had in the, you know, the top shelf of every typical magic shop in the world, pretty much. So I went through the, the you know, traditional phases that a lot of guys that wind up doing close-up went through. I had all the little Adams, you know, almost slum magic. I had a stripper deck and a Svengali deck and a color Monty, and I had a scotch and soda and a Nichols the Dimes. I had all of that stuff. Um, 
And so now I'm probably 19 years old, and I went back to Memphis uh, to work in a camp, a summer camp, and wanted to uh, wanted to kind of have something cool to do. So I really started to get into magic, and it was in uh, a magic shop in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm from Knoxville, and that's where I, this uh, original magic shop opened up. But in a magic shop in Memphis, Tennessee, a, a magician who's no longer with us named Jim Surprise uh, showed me a fantastic Brother John Hammond card trick called The Twins. And I knew just enough about card magic. I knew Stripper Deck, Svengali Principle, um, Rough and Smooth. I knew those three things. And so when I saw a card trick that, for those of you that know The Twins, is pretty incredible how much magic you get out of just four cards. When I saw that trick, and he let me examine those cards, and there is no stripper principle, there is no Svengali principle, and there is no rough and smooth, my head exploded. I had no idea what I had just seen. And I thought, i got to learn that. Uh, I want to learn that. Where do I learn that? He said, well, you're in luck. Right over there on the shelf is the book, The Secrets of Brother John Hammond. It was just published a couple of years ago. And so I bought the book just to learn that trick. Uh, it was really the first real card trick I ever learned. I learned how to... I learned how to do the how I learned how the trick works sitting in my car in the parking lot of the magic shop. Uh, of course, I couldn't do it, but I understood it then. Um, a week later, in a competing magic shop on the other side of town in Memphis, uh, a guy who is also no longer with us, a guy named Dick Oakley, Richard Oakley, showed me Di Vernon's Triumph. And uh, Di Vernon's Triumph didn't use a stripper deck, didn't use the uh, Svengali principle, didn't use rough and smooth and didn't use the principle that Jim had fooled me with a week ago. So again, my head explodes because there's something else that I've never seen before. Uh, that trick is a miracle, and to this day, it's probably my favorite card trick is Triumph. Um, I've done it all over the world for people that don't speak English, and I don't speak a foreign language, and you don't have to say a word. The instant you shuffle those cards face up and face down, they're intrigued because nobody does that. And then when you spread those cards face down and there's that one face up card, you know, right in the middle, you don't have to say a word. Uh, obviously, I do, I do speak when I perform it, but it's a perfect example of a card trick that um, doesn't require any uh, overt communication because it says everything it needs to say. It's impossible. They have no idea how it works. Um, and it's pretty cool all at the same time, you know, and so uh, I was hooked. I've been primarily a card magician ever since. That would have been summer of 1990. 19, so that means you've been a magician, uh, you've been a fan of magic since you were when, uh, and a magician since seven, when? You know, yeah, so a fan of magic for 35 years, and been performing uh, magic, um, you know, probably for 12 or 13 years now. Um, I, uh, I wasn't a professional until I got out of the Air Force. Um, and, uh, and started making my living doing magic. But, you know, I, I was a very good amateur for a, a lot of years because I had some really great teachers that helped me out a lot. Uh, but I didn't start making my living doing magic until uh, 2007. Uh, Vinny, can you chime in and share your story of how you got started magic briefly and how, specifically how you got entwined with the SAM? Yeah, it, it's what Brian and Jason said. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, but in, in all seriousness, it is. Uh, I mean, Brian said uh, about spite. I was 12 years old, and um, I was away from home over the summer. My birthday was over the summer, and I found a magic shop. I was in San Diego, and I spent all my birthday. I had like I don't know, maybe 30 bucks birthday money. And I spent it all at a magic shop that was going out of business and had 50% off. And when my father got home, he was like yelling at my mother, how can you let him spend all of his money on, on this stuff? He's not going to use it and, and all this other stuff. And uh, so out of spite, I was like, no, I'll show him. I'm going to use it. <laughs> um, and then what Jason was saying, uh, you know, I, I had the, all the same stuff, the Svengali deck and the Scotch and soda, all these gimmick things. And then I went and saw a magician in, in San Diego, Mike Stillwell, who worked at uh, the Corvette Diner at the time. And he was doing amazing stuff with a deck of cards. And I went up to him afterwards. I said, I have the Svengali deck, but what deck is that that you're using? And he goes, Royal Road to Card Magic. So um, he opened my eyes up to, you know, thing, you know, sleight of hand and, and that kind of stuff. And, and he even helped me out uh, whenever I wanted to buy something. 
you know, this is back when I would buy things. I don't know if you guys remember Rabbit in the Hat Ranch uh, newsletter thing, but that was like, that was gold when that showed up at my door. Um, so he was, he would kind of guide me as to what was crap and what was good uh, at purchasing stuff. And the SAM, that's probably another spite story. I tried to join the SAM when I was uh, still in high school. And the Were you denied by the IBM? And I got, I got into the IBM, but the SAM, the local assembly, did not allow me in. So I was like, you know, screw this. I'm not joining the SAM now. Now, so on, on what grounds? Like, what, what did they say? They say I, your magic sucks? There's a no, magic. I was too young, and they wanted to tell dirty jokes in the meeting. And how, old, <laughs> how, how old were you? You were, like, you were 30 then? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was, it, yeah, it was right when I started to lose my hair. So, it was, <laughs> um, so after like a while, uh, when I became of age, and, and I was in the area and, and doing things. They were like, oh, you should join. You should join. I said, no way. You guys didn't let me in. I'm not going to join. And the, one of the guys there that helped me out, his name is Jay Gorham, uh, kept pestering. We were at, like, some magic event, and he kept pestering me. You know, you should join. You should join. And just to shut him up, I was like, you know, Jay, the only way I would join is if they make you national president. Little did I know, 15 years later, he became national president. That's and, awesome. Uh, and so I went to the, the – it was in Las Vegas, and it was, it was almost 10 years ago. And I uh, became a member there, and a few years later, I started moving up the, uh, the ladder of uh, officers, and, and a few years ago, I was president. It's awesome. So what, what I think is really interesting is it seems like there's a few um, common threads with uh, all three of our stories. And I actually want to hear your story as well, Jonathan. Yeah. But, um, but, no, you uh, don't. But it seems like almost all magicians are constantly chasing that high of when they were first fooled and yeah. then the transformation of understanding like, oh, no, wait, I can do this, and then, and then getting it down. And then the moment they get it down, they lose interest in it. And they're like, okay, now I'm not interested in that because if I could do it, it can't be that great after all. Right. But then, uh, and so they're constantly looking for that next thing. Mine was um, I saw Copperfield come through my hometown uh, Charleston, South Carolina, a very small town, no magic shops nearby here when I was five years old. And I was like, that's the coolest thing. I mean, it was, it was his Dreams and Nightmares show. Um, you know, if you've been to Copperfield show um, recently, that's the fan and crazy, enormous grand illusions. And I was five, six years old, and I saw this, and I wanted to literally be that guy up on stage. Like, not just to like, kind of do something simple. I wanted to, like, literally, if I could teleport myself, from where I was to the stage, and I was obsessed with that. And then I wanted to learn magic, of course, and uh, perform, and I wanted to do stage shows. And so I started performing then for anything. I started reading books in library, the public library, which is all I had. There was a, there was a magic shop in Myrtle Beach that's called um, Broadway Magic, and I used to go there. Anytime my family would go out of town, we'd always go by the magic store in whatever city we were in Atlanta, like Jason was saying earlier. And uh, I just, like, literally just you know, a hoarded magic tricks and try to learn as much as I could. I tried to meet uh, as many magicians as I possibly could, but there was the, the kind of kept coming back to that there was no magicians in my hometown. So I felt kind of stunted by that. But I continued to perform for birthday parties and then but I realized like I don't want to do this for birthday parties. I want to be David Copperfield. So I gotta like I gotta step up my act. And so uh, when I was thirteen, so and I was in magic for six or seven years at that point. I was like, okay, you know what, I'm ready. I could totally uh, be David Copperfield now. I've been doing this. You know, I'm 13 years old. I know multiplication. Uh, I know what is holding me back at this point. So I rented out a theater. I swear, I mean, I rented out the theater. It was uh, $550 or something to rent out this theater for a day. I saved up. I mowed lawns for a few summers. And I, was, I rented this theater, and it was 500 seats. And in my naive 13, literally 13 years old, it was December 29th, 1999, uh, in my 13-year-old he old head, if I rented this theater and if I threw together enough tricks, it's in, I guess I didn't worry about if everyone in the back could see them. Then, uh, then, then we could. Uh, it would. It would be a show. Justin Willman's, uh, I believe, on here now too. I'm going to get to him in a second. Um, so I, I thought if I built this show and if I made this show, then people would um, would just show up for it, and I, I sold tickets. So I, I booked this show, I announced it, I printed posters, I printed myself at Kinko's and at office supply stores, I plastered the town with all these posters for my show, I charged $8 a ticket, and I called all the radio stations, newspapers, whatever, this is when I was 13, and uh, I just thought this is how you do it. And somehow that show sold out um, that night, and that was when I was 13, 
and the show is horrible. You cannot pay me to watch a tape of that show now. I'm sure everyone's first performance on this panel. Does that, uh, does that exist? Does the tape exist? <laughs> Uh, I will not confirm or deny that. <laughs> uh, but uh, I did it, and then after that, you know, I, I, I think I was cognizant of the fact that that show is not ideal. I knew that I was doing, I was doing like parlor magic tricks on a 500 seat theater. So that was, I knew that was like I was pull, I was stretching this. But I just did it, and no one, you know, whether out of uh, support or arguably neglect, uh, my parents t didn't tell me not to do this, and they just kind of encouraged me, go for it. And so out of ignorance and complete naivety, that's how I got started um, in performing, wanting to be like David Copperfield. And then this whole Theory 11 thing came about because there was no magic stores in my hometown. I had nowhere to learn from, so I was solo. And the only thing I could turn to, being an internet nerd, in, uh, in like 8th grade, ninth grade, was the internet as a way to meet other magicians and share ideas and learn things. And, and Theory 11 was a side effect of that. Not a bad side effect. It, it it worked well. It worked out. You know, but JB, I, 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 what were you saying? The big, the big lesson, JB, that I take away from your story is those poor bastards in Charleston, South Carolina, must have really been starved for entertainment. <laughs> they, paid, they paid eight dollars to see a thirteen-year-old. Uh, exactly. But uh, no, I winged it together. So I mean, my, my I guess my only uh, uh, thing I could it's a teachable moment from that is you have to dare to you have to be willing to suck. You have to be willing to you know go out and do something uh, risky. I'm golden then. Yeah. In my case, doing something risky was you know booking a show at a theater where I've never done a theater show before. I didn't even have a I didn't have a, an act. I literally had individual tricks that I was doing for my friends, and I just have to figure out a way to wing them together in some way with awkward as, as hell transition. So like, anyway, enough about that dove pan. Let's talk about this coloring book. Like, <laughs> the most awkward transitions in the history of time. But I made it work, and then I did, you know, every few months thereafter, I'm doing other um, shows. Um, Justin Willman, late, um, late welcome. Sorry, I was rambling. Uh, but Justin Willman is on the panel. If you see him below, he was added to this a few moments ago. Hi. Justin, where are you right now? Sorry, I'm late. Where, I'm in a Starbucks on Beverly Boulevard. Nice. Do you get a Los Angeles latte? I got my Dopio Campagna. Nice, nice. And getting free internet from here. Hi guys, how's it going? Um, so you're joined on this panel by Vinny Grasso, who at least on my screen is to your right, is uh, former national president yep. of the SAM. Uh, to to my left, Jason England, of course, and to the left of him in our Brady Bunch of style display here is uh, Mr. Brian Brushwood. Hi, Brian. Hey man, um, uh, I actually uh, we were just talking about uh, what the first show experience is that transition of when you really officially begin your career in magic, uh, and we all shared our stories. I would love to hear yours. First show. So I was um, I grew up in St. Louis and I got my start doing shows with my mentor, Doctor Magic. It was his stage name, Jerry Hughes, uh, was his name, and I used to uh, open for him at charity events and. Uh, I remember uh, this one charity event, it was for the Juvenile Hemophiliacs Association, and he did not show up. I don't know if it was intentional, if it was like his Mr. Miyagi moment of saying, you're ready, but he didn't show up, so I did a whole show alone. And everything went well until uh, I was doing the pizza oven surprise trick, it's like a die box, but with a fake pizza, that the audience will see slide from one side to the other. And the trick begins by you planting the pizza on the back of a kid and then it reappears at the end on this kid's back. So I've got this little fake pizza with a little safety pin hook, and when he comes on stage, I place him on a spot, and I hang this on his back. And right when I hang it, I hear him go, ouch! And, and, then, uh, and then I remembered I'm performing at a hemophiliacs association event. Oh. And the kid <laughs> might have just gotten pricked by a pin. And so the whole, re and this was my mid midway through the show, and um, it turns out he was a sibling of a hemophiliac. He did not die. And uh, the kids were surprised that the pizza appeared on his back. But nevertheless, um, I found a different hanging method after that. Justin can, you, <laughs> Justin, can you tell your story back before that of your start in magic? What inspired you to actually start magic to begin with? Uh, sure. Um, you know, living in St. Louis, I. It was a great place to have a lot of great magicians coming through. So Harry Blackstone Jr. would come through town a lot, and uh, Copperfield would come through town a lot, and I'd see him at the Fox Theater in St. Louis, this beautiful venue, and I'd be a young kid. My parents would always be great and take us and get good seats. So, you know, for the Blackstone Jr. birdcage trick, I'd come up and put my hands on it and 
Uh, Copperfield, of course, during this time, would always, after every show, would come out and sign for everybody. And it just left a great impression on me, being great magicians. And then the, the, the fad passed. And then when I was like 12, I had an accident where I was riding my bike uh, while wearing rollerblades down a hill to impress some girls. And my, it didn't work out, surprisingly. The rollerblades got stuck in the gears, and I broke both arms at the same time. And my, uh, re my orthopedic surgeon recommended learning physical therapy when I got my cast off to... Um, I recommended learning magic as physical therapy when I got my cast off. And Dr. Magic, that, that later mentor, came through Children's Hospital a lot, and it just kind of reconnected me with magic at the right time, and, and I've been doing it ever since then. I don't have any glorious uh, sellout shows when I was 13, though. Like <laughs> uh, glorious is probably not the right adjective to describe that show um, in reflection, but... Uh, Something well, what's funny is that you said that, you, that your downfall was that you were doing parlor magic in a 500 seat theater, and that is my goal. That is what I do. <laughs> my, that's my career is parlor magic. Well, yeah, but you, you obviously have to keep in mind like the fact that you're you're performing for a large uh, venue. Like you're you're not just performing for uh, people that are. Uh, uh, I guess in a, uh, a small venue. So you have to keep in mind that the people in the back of the audience have to be able to see it. I had no awareness of that whatsoever, so I just did tricks that probably no one could see in the back of the audience, and they worked really well for my friends in seventh grade, and just hope for the best when people did them on, tele on, uh, on stage. Now, so now at, at this moment, as you retell the story, JB, you clearly cringe and talk about how bad it must have been, but at that moment, did, did you just feel on top of the world? Did you just feel oh, like you awesome, defeated man. King Kong? Awesome. yeah. It was, I mean, I realized I had no idea what I was doing, and it, it was exhilarating and awesome to have no idea what you're doing and, and doing something that level. I was, I don't know if nervous was the right word for it. It was just cognizant of my own naivety. I realized then, all of a sudden, like, oh, my God, like right before that show started, I remember remembering, knowing what the hell did I get myself into. But I guess, like, that's sort of like, I don't know. I, I, I still get that feeling, you know, when you're about to perform something for, for people or especially a big group, like, uh, what the hell am I about to do? And you, obviously you, you want to be experienced and you want to get enough experience under your belt and rehearse enough and practice enough where you feel like you're, you're ready to do that. But, um, well, and I, I guess like, uh, it sounds to me like that's another common thread throughout all these stories is not only a willingness to, to fail, but, but the importance of those ridiculous failures. Yeah. So that, to, that, to that leads you. me to our next question. So I wrote this down before. This is one of my uh, questions for everyone on the panel. Brian, you can start. Uh, I said everyone in this panel tonight is objectively successful in various ways and various styles of magic, areas of magic. Um, any success typically comes with uh, several mag magnificent failures. Uh, so can, can can you reflect and remember one specific epic failure uh, in a show or in something else that something went wrong or something went very badly? Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. There's no shortage of those. I mean, the, the one thing that, that uh, sort of transformed me, like, there, there's one routine I do where I get two people from the audience and I put a blindfold on one and put a box over his head. The other one picks a category of drawing from a bunch of cards and one person draws a, a, a drawing and the other person hopefully draws a drawing that match and it's and it's not nothing's pre-set up beforehand i just go out i pick two people uh it, it relies on a number of things that are out of my control and i remember thinking as i wrote this i'm like i think this is a really good routine but i don't know what you know what's going to happen if it goes wrong and then uh you know for the first like dozen two dozen times it worked great and then it got to this uh the, and it's an eight minute long routine talking about all oh, we're going to do a scientific esp test and see about this and that and let's get this guy up build up build up build up build up and then the first time it went wrong like just ridiculously terribly wrong the two pictures did not match at all uh not knowing what else to say i just said and that's why i don't believe in esp and then to my astonishment the the audience started clapping and then the routine went over and it, it, it was fine it was as good as any other routine uh, but but that's the opposite of what you asked for. You wanted a spectacular failure, and I totally remember. It's a, uh, I don't know if I've told this story here. Uh, I did a, um, a, a university, this big event at a festival, 900-seat auditorium, one of the biggest uh, places I had ever worked at the time. Uh, and this is after I'd worked at a lot of colleges, and I was starting to feel really good about my show. Um, something about the West Virginia crowd on that day uh, you know, my, my show is very much anti-traditional magic, anti-sparkly suits and all that stuff. Uh, turns out they were looking for the sparkly suits, and they full-on did not like my show at all. 
And uh, as I left the stage, somebody threw an orange at, at my props, and it hit it and just splattered down. And I was like, they're throwing fruit at my stage. That, that really <laughs> happens. And, uh, and, uh, that was a movie thing. Yeah, no, exactly. But it did a, a really good job of, of letting me see the importance of setting expectations beforehand. In fact, it was after that show, uh, the ne- before the next show, like, like I, I made it a written priority that I need to have some kind of pre-show video so that when people come in, they understand what they're getting into. It was clear that they were looking for the one thing and I turned out to be another thing. And, uh, and ultimately, that's on me because you know, I didn't set the narrative. I didn't shape their expectations from the moment they walked in the door. And, uh, and so now when you come in, you know, there's all these very, very countercultural references and a lot of uh, all the trappings of, you know, reminders like, hey, you're here to see Brian Brushwood. Here's the kind of stuff he thinks is funny. Hopefully you will as well. Uh, but, you know, so there was a good lesson that came of it. But, man, that sucks. That sucks to have people throw fruit at your stage. I don't recommend it. Jason, have any, has anyone ever thrown fruit at you? Uh, no. Um, you know, it, it might be a little bit different for me because I, uh, you know, like I said before, I've only been doing magic as my living for the past, you know, seven years and maybe three or four years, you know, semi-professional before that where I would do paid shows, but I had a day job, you know, I was active duty military for 15 years. Um, and so what that meant was that, um, you know, I had 17 years of practice, really, before I had to hang a shingle and call myself a professional magician. Um, and so, you know, I haven't had a lot of disastrous shows where something goes wrong. Um, the, the shows where I would tell you something went wrong and an outsider watching couldn't, couldn't necessarily tell is uh, it, it kind of drives me up the wall when someone is watching me perform that clearly doesn't want to be there. Um, and I can pick up on it. So, you know, I do a lot, of, uh, a lot of corporate stuff. And it's not difficult at all to see that the CEO is sitting directly across from me having a blast. He's loving it. Um, and, you know, the vice president on his left really digging it, vice president on his right, really digging it. But then there's this person over here in the corner, male or female, it doesn't matter, who's really responsible for the whole evening. You know, they've set the whole thing up, and they've got 10 million things going on in their heads, and they just have absolutely no interest in what I'm doing. And that's fine. You know, they, from, from my point of view, they should have no interest in what I'm doing. They need to be off handling business somewhere. You know, they're trying to schedule 10 meetings for the next morning. They're trying to schedule uh, that one vice president whose kid got sick and he couldn't fly in on time, and he's not getting in until midway through dinner tomorrow. And they've got audiovisual problems for the thing tomorrow morning that they're dealing with. But for whatever reason, they're sitting at the table with me and the CEO and the vice presidents from the different departments, and they're obviously distracted and miserable. And that drives me up the wall um, because I feel for them. You know, I don't, I don't blame them. I feel for them. I wish there was some way for me to say, hey, we're having a blast. Why don't you cut this guy loose? So he can go do whatever it is he needs to do because he's, you know, he's he's one step away from taking his phone out and start solving, you know, the problems that he needs to solve for that evening or the next day or whatever. So stuff like that internally drives me up the wall. Obviously, I can't let it show, um, but I leave those shows um, feeling like I didn't do my job. Uh, it's you know, not because of anything I did, or it's not even because of anything he did. It's because it's a bad situation. You know, you this in, it's like you, a, you came in at a, and disadvantaged already. He, he wasn't yeah. wanting to be entertained, and so you, you came in at a, at a negative. If that's yeah. your worst yeah. performance story, though, then I've got you beat, because mine was uh, way worse than that. It was like one of my first shows, and uh, not the first, but it was one of the first shows, and my finale, my like, my big closer, I was really excited about, was the Elaine Chaquette um, effect with the Gypsy Thread. Um, with the, if everyone familiar with this, uh, you take the thread, you break it into several pieces. You can learn it on Theory 11, uh, and you 
then make the thread fuse back together again. Yeah, so you, you make the thread fuse back uh, together again. A very old effect, classic effect in magic. Um, and I did it as Elaine Shokat's presentation of it. With, there was music and everything. This is the last final effect of the show. And I remember like walking up to the table of where I was going to perform that, and I had a video camera screen at that point where it was brought, showing the audience. It was a larger audience. And I was like, wow, everything went right in this show. Like I nailed this one and grabbed the thread, did the whole thing, and at the very end where you go to fully extend that thread and it, you know, like an iPhone thread, it, it is now restored, uh, it, it was clearly knotted. Um, and I could not get it beyond about here. And then in my head, um, I guess the, the correct um, emotional uh, response that I had, like internally I was saying like, shit, 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 shit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, outwardly I was like, I can get this, I can salvage this, and I just said, like, in my head, this is a great show. I just nailed this. And then I'm here, and this is not happening. So I do the worst possible thing out of aggravation or, I guess, frustration. I pull really hard, and that just tightens the crap out of that knot. <laughs> so now I've got this bundle up piece of thread. It's like this long. The music's crescendoing. <laughs> it's, the, it's the final trick in the show. And I had, and that was it. And that was it. So what? Do you, I mean, I had no comeback for that. I mean, I tried to have a, uh, a response or a plan B for everything else that I was doing. But what do you do when there's a threat? I mean, have another threat? I didn't do that. So it was just like. <laughs> so so what? What do you do? Do you pause or, or be like, let me tell you how it's supposed to go? Or I I, I wasn't. I had no experience. This is you know my third or fourth uh, large stage show. I had no idea of how to recover from things like that yet. I was not experienced enough. Jason England had just said he had 17 years of experience before he started really performing for paid gigs. I had about 17 minutes of experience at that point. And uh, no, I think I, I think my words were like, <laughs> I think my verbatim was something like, Magic this, is hard. This, no, I, no, I, I think I said, this is usually really cool. <laughs> And that was my that was my big response. And then you know yeah, and the music's crescendoing, like the lighting. I had like crazy lighting and stuff. And that was my finale of my show, and it was wonderful. Justin, <laughs> I think you have him muted. Can you hear me? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, yeah, because uh, we were having the background music. No, can't hear you, Justin. Can you hear me? Maybe unplug your uh, headphones and plug them back in. See if it uh, detects. Unless you're talking. Unless you're whispering. Have you tried I... rebooting? There we go. There it is. There, there it is. Yeah. Got it. I thought you, you got were... me. Yes, you're good. So, uh, what is your uh, besides your hemophiliac uh, story? What is oh, the most man. what is the most significant magic epic fail? Okay, epic fail. So uh, when I first moved to LA, my, my main uh, business was doing kids' birthday parties, and I I I, I fancied myself a children's birthday uh, expert at this point. I started doing kids shows when I was like 14, and moved to LA when I'm 22, and I'm a big believer in it being a good foundation for uh, performing career. Uh, you know, having a commando act you can perform anywhere, and I was doing uh, I would always open the show with a dove, and I'd close the show with a bunny. Okay, bookending it with Animal Productions, and I'd open the show with the uh, the Book of Life. So you show this book that has uh, an egg and it's cracking, and then a picture of a, a bird, and then you flick it like this, and then the bird flutters out, and you've got a dove. It's a, a beautiful production. So I was doing a show in a backyard. I made the dove appear, and a little gust of wind happened, and the dove flew up to uh, a tree. So there's the dove in the backyard, and it's the opening bit of the show. And this happens sometimes. The wings are clipped every other feather, so it can kind of fly. So it's like. It got its way to the tree. And then I'm doing my show and waiting for the dove to flutter down, and it didn't flutter down. I made the rabbit appear. And then I'm, I told the mom I was going to stick around, and when all the kids leave, I'll climb the tree and get the dove, because that's, you know, $40 right there, and it's my baby dove. So as the kids are singing happy birthday, this is not a lie, a hawk starts circling in the sky. And as the birthday, happy birthday is during the end, the hawk swoops down. This is like in California here, so there's hawks. And it swoops down, and it just grapples this dove out of the tree and just flies away with the dove in front of all the kids. Uh, and kids were crying. It was, uh, it, was, it was an epic fail, and I was like, thank you, good night. 
Um, that's how I stopped. That's how I stopped working with. Dallas. You started with the production and you ended it with the vanish. That's amazing. <laughs> they didn't do it with the vanish. Turns out that dub was a hemophiliac as well. I I know. But that happened. I did also once do the master prediction uh, box where I do like the the Twitter prediction, um, and it's the end of the show, kind of like your gypsy thread moment. And I get it down and I put it on the table and it's locked and I reach in my pocket for the key and I can't. There's no key and I'm like, shoot. And then I'm gesturing backstage, looking for the key, and I lost the key to the box that has the big prediction reveal in it. And that's the only way to get in the box unless you want to, you know, ruin the trick. So uh, <laughs> I, 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 I was like, just trust me, guys. Inside this box is everything you just said, but uh, you have to trust me. Good night. Yeah, that was, that was basically that was, my response. That that. Usually this string is yeah. much... Longer, longer at this point <laughs> and less naughty. So the, um, the the lesson though is to always have some backup closer in your case uh, when the shit hits the fan. You got something you can end the show with because you know if, if you save your best for the last and the last thing doesn't work, you're you're screwed. So always have something there. Yes, uh, that is worst comes to worst. That is what I learned as well. I mean, you see, a, a, you know, Copperfield show has not only a backup of what's you know what's supposed to happen with that specific trick, but then there's a backup of that, and then there's you know s other tricks and other things that he can do to occupy the audience if something's you know, happening um, and needs to be fixed. There's a backup and then a backup and then a backup of a backup, um, which and still things will go wrong. But if you have that many. Um, I guess contingency plans. Then the audience is very unlikely to notice anything that is drastically wrong, to the extent of my show. Or like you know, you were saying you don't have a backup to like, oh well, if the hawk comes and kills my dove, then I'm obviously <laughs> gonna be the what do you do? An extra dove. <laughs> I wouldn't have planned for that. Um, I wanted yeah. to to get there's a, there's a bunch of viewer questions coming in, and Vinny, I'll get you on this one too. Um, is asking about how to create a persona when performing of how do you find your own style or begin to infuse some personality, whether you call that patter or just, I mean, I guess increasing the entertainment value of what you're presenting by infusing your own personality in it. How do you find your persona? How did you find your persona when you're performing? Who are you going with on this? Uh, Vinny, you can I'd love to hear right. Justin's on this because okay. I, Justin has evolved. You know, okay, the, Justin, go. Yeah. Well, well, thank you guys. Um, the the only way to do it, I think, is to do an incredible amount of shows. Um, I was for, like I said, like children's parties was one thing, but Brian Rushwood and I were both fortunate enough to come up in the college circuit. That when you get the right place at the right time, you could do a show every night in front of a fresh audience, and every night try new things and hone new things in front of a real crowd. And that's really, I mean, I I, I don't know any other way. I always read about Lance Burton like having that tipping point moment where he was doing a theme park uh, one summer and he was doing his dove act six times a day and you just get so good so fast and I think persona wise it's the only thing only way to really master it is to be on stage for an incredible length of time I'm sure Brian will agree that uh, the college circuit for us was uh, crucial uh, to being able to really hone who we are and especially and, it, and it's a market where you're doing shows for people who encourage you to be real and authentic you know corporate market you know I, I wouldn't be the place for me to hone my persona because I'd have to be put on a different persona a little bit. But, it's, uh, uh, but the, the, the whole can... uh, corporate shows, and I would love to, I'd love to hear from Jason on this. It, they they are such an enigma to me because you have uh, so many different audiences at the same time. You you are trying to please the person who is making the decision to purchase your show, but at the same time, hopefully, do a show that's entertaining for the crowd. There, um, do do you find that? How do you let your personality and character? Uh, what what guidelines do you have to put on that, Jason, in order to to work within those confines? Well, you know, it's, <clears throat> I'm kind of a uh, you know I may be sort of a special case, um, not not unique because there are other guys out there uh, similar to me, but but special in the sense that there's not a lot of us. I am often hired not to do magic per se, but to do the gambling act and to you know present sort of a uh, a gambling slash cheating expose act, and so many many times um, I've been hired, and there's a magician working the room, walking around doing magic tricks. Um, I'm uh, in uh, at one edge of the room or in a corner at a poker table, 
uh, set up or something at a poker table or a blackjack table doing a gambling expose act. And there could be a pickpocket working the crowd. I've worked with Paula Robbins many times. Um, you know, there could be uh, some other type of performer doing something else in the room. So, so for me, it's a little bit different. But I think largely, um, corporate guys are two minutes um, are close enough to their real persona. For instance, if you've ever hung out with Bill Malone or David Williamson, arguably two of the best American corporate magicians in the world right now. Uh, Eric Mead and Michael Weber would also be in that group. Guys that are just doing corporate shows day in and day out. Their performing personas are not very far away from their real personas at all. Um, Williamson and Malone are a little bit more hyper on stage than they are in person. But if you've spent five minutes around those guys in private, you know that they are genuinely funny. That's not an act. They're genuinely zany and you know willing to say anything at any time. That's not an act. Weber and Mead are uh, are more cerebral. That's not an act. They're really like that. You know, both of them are capable of saying very funny things, but um, but you know their their performances are more cerebral, and it's just a, it's really a part of who they are. Whereas if you look at Johnny Thompson, his stage performer or his stage persona is that of you know, a guy kind of stumbling through his magic act. You get Johnny off in private, and he's nothing like the bumbling idiot. You know, he's the closest thing we have to a to a godfather of magic. Uh, if you look at Matt King, you know, he's the moron on stage that somehow is fooling you. You get him off stage, and you realize he's not a moron at all. He's a genius. Same thing with Mike Caveney. The guy's not an idiot. He's pretending to be an idiot. The truth is he's one of the finest performers in the world. So those guys, and, and I really think it has to do with the distance between them and the audience, can create a persona that you take on and take off. I don't take off my gambling persona when I come home. You know, 10 feet from where I'm sitting right now, there are 500 gambling books. That's genuinely what there's I'm also, interested There's in. also a geometry book, uh, I believe I can see behind you, and one that says... Uh, a great geometry book, by the way. Um, I, I'm trying to see what's in Jason England's secret uh, book stash. Actually, a uh, quick question for Justin Willman. Did you just get kicked out of Starbucks? I got, I got kicked out of Starbucks, guys. I'm on the street. Uh, I, thought the lighting, I thought the lighting was better out here, I think. <laughs> all I saw was movement all of a sudden from the lower quad. Yeah, sorry. And actually, what's funny is now are. it looks like you're, uh, you're on a green screen set now. Yeah. This is fantastic. <laughs> I know, this looks so real. You're on a roller coaster. Hollywood, guys. I don't even know it's that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, as far as as far as like practical advice to uh, to anyone getting started who's trying to figure out like you know who am I in magic? The best article I read and and I cannot remember if it was written by Penn or Teller. Uh, I want to say it was in Genie Magazine in the early '90s. Talked about how you should let hate, not love, be your guiding force. And their point was. Uh, for me, it, it, it really struck true because I loved Penn and Teller. Ever since I was in second grade, I wanted to be Penn and Teller. Uh, and essentially what the article told me is, don't try to be Penn and Teller. If you do, you'll just be a pale imitation of Penn and Teller. You'll be, Penn and Teller, you'll be, you'll be a, a picture of Penn and Teller, and your act will suck. You want to be good? Then be the opposite of everything you hate. Because uh, there is something new and undiscovered in you that uh, that that needs to be there, and so uh, to be honest, that's that's the bulk of where my act came from. Uh, once I decided to go professional, is is I would learn a trick and I'd be like, ah, oh, that, that's so stupid. That's the dumbest line. Nobody who would say that in real life. And so it's like, and then I I, I would just you know, there's this kind of anger at at or I don't want to say anger, but but this frustration at magic that that kind of comes through throughout the, uh, the my entire stage show now. And that was all born out of you know, what do I hate? in magic what am i frustrated by in magic and how can i be the opposite of that and so if you start with that very counterintuitive question i think you'll find some surprises talking about um uh working in magic and people you know getting started working in magic i see a lot of questions uh both in this chat and also there's one in our forums yesterday of people asking how do they get started working in magic how do they be become successful in magic and obviously for the people watching this who just do magic as a hobby or just like performing for your friends, there's nothing wrong with that. There's no more or less valid than anything else performing magic. There's incredible guitar players that just play, um, you know, 
uh, or music by themselves. There's also people that publish things. There's also people that perform things. So whatever your reason is that you do magic, uh, th there's you know that's that's outstanding. But for the people that do say that I want to make a career out of this, you know, there was a guy in our forums yesterday saying, you know, I've been practicing close-up magic for a long time. I really want to start performing in uh, fine hotels, like nice hotels and four and five star resorts. And I'm assuming he was, you know, that's inspired by like the Steve Cohen type of performance. And Steve performs in the Waldorf Astoria in New York City and has done the show for over a decade now. But I think that comes from a place of, you know, thinking that Steve Cohen just walked into the Waldorf Astoria one day and was like, hey guys, I do magic and I would like to you know, render my services for your fine establishment when that was not the case at all. I mean, Steve Cohen, I know for a fact, worked on that show uh, and invested his own money into it for years and years before it ever was remotely successful in any, in any event. Um, before he was the millionaire's magician, he was probably the thousandaire's magician and the hundredaire's magician. And you know, it's years. Before that, that, he was the hobo's magician. Yeah, he was the the, uh, the hobo magician. But uh, and you know, he worked his way up and he honed his craft. And now, if you've seen Steve Cohen's show um, at the Waldorf, it's extremely polished. And you know, you can tell he does that show uh, five to ten times a weekend. Um, and you can just tell that level of polish in the show. Similarly, if you see Copperfield's show, David just finished. Um, 165 shows over the course of 11 weeks straight without a single day off in that process of 11 weeks. So doing that many shows uh, is obviously going to hone your performance craft, but how do you become successful? Like how do you keep hitting something until you actually achieve a level of success in it? What advice would you give, I guess, is the, the question to someone that's young or someone that's not young who currently does not do magic as a profession or for work and they want to, what advice would you give to them, Brian Brushwood? Um, set written goals. The closest thing to real magic that exists in the world is the power of the written goal. And uh, post them in the shower where you'll see them every day. Post them in the, uh, on your mirror where you'll see them every time you brush your teeth and, uh, uh, and in your office. Uh, and make them specific and read, read all those cheesy books about success because your first year of doing this, you are going to need to get fired up and stay fired up. So do all the, the cheesy motivational courses, learn all the tricks about self-affirmations, you know, do things like what, what Jim Carrey did, you know, write a check to yourself for a million dollars with a date on it, set deadlines and solve problems and realize that, that you are, you have to work hard all the time. And, um, and that's the end of it, and, 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 and embrace that. I think, yeah, it's, it's about keeping up that fire within yourself of having a goal, knowing at least what you want to do. That's the first step. What do you want to do? What, what would be your dream? And is that really your dream, or is that because you saw someone else doing it and it was their dream and you thought it was you know, neat and interesting? Or is that really like within yourself, that is your dream that you cannot stop thinking about you know, for months and months and months? Um, well, and in many ways, it's one of those things where it's like you don't even have a um, you don't even have a choice. It doesn't feel like work. You know, I've worked way way harder. I mean, even now, technically, we're all working. You know, in that in that we're we're having these discussions, but but I don't think it feels like work to any of us. This is the kind of thing that we live and breathe and want to do, and so maximize your flight time. Right, and, and, and doing it and realizing that, okay, you have this goal now, you have this dream that you want to do, and you're really set that this specifically is your dream, this is your goal, and it doesn't have to be a 10-year goal, it could be a, you know, a one-year goal, it could be a one-month goal, it could be small goals of what you want to do, and then just literally pursuing it and not, telling any, not allowing anyone to tell you otherwise. Um, you know, if someone would have told me, if my parents would have told me, hey, you know what, you shouldn't have done that, you shouldn't do this first show, you should probably start at you know, something less than 500 seats, maybe for your first uh, stage show and maybe don't sell tickets maybe do it for free people could have told me that and it's entirely accurate valid advice but don't you know, tie that knot so tight it's what and don't tie that knot so tight don't, don't, don't tie <laughs> the knot so tight on your gypsy thread there's so much advice that I could have taken but you know me being I, I guess it's a it's an element of, of stubbornness I think as well of like even if everyone's telling you not to do something you can't do something uh, you know the results speak that you can't do something and you convince yourself otherwise and you are forcing you know, something to happen and, and pushing something to happen so that any setbacks and failures along the way, like 
I could have done that show and no one showed up. And what I, what I have done, I wouldn't have stopped. I would have done another show a month later and I would have figured out a different way to promote it. And, and if that worked, and I would have kept doing it and doing it and doing it until I found something that worked. So it's like, a, it's, it's, it's well, like, and that's, that's a really good point is, is, you know, success and failure are just labels that we put on experiences after the fact. Uh, if, if you don't care about succeeding or failing, or failing, that's my word. Uh, then, then what you do, then everything becomes an experiment. And if something, let's say you did that and, and 20 people showed up, you learned a very good lesson. Like, wow, I really learned an important lesson that's going to make sure that I promote the next show I do effectively. And you wouldn't even couch that as a failure, really. No, it, def it definitely wouldn't. If anything, it would, it would. I guess you know you're on the right track when if something bad happens, it doesn't discourage you. It motivates you further and it like adds fuel to the fire of like, oh, nope, I got to step it up. I got to do more. I got to do more. I got to do more. I have to work harder, faster. Uh, that's when you know you, you you know you believe in something because uh, that's that's how you're you're pursuing it. You're pursuing it, Justin. I feel like we should interview people like on the street behind you because it's like the Jay Leno segment where you're interviewing people on the street. Yeah, we, I don't know if you saw the Papa John's truck, but I think we made some money from Papa John's <laughs> with that advertisement. I'm going to actually um, order. You know, I was going to say about this, this, whole, this whole conversation, I think the one thing um, people who want to you know, be successful need to remember is that the people who they look up to, um, the people who they see doing their thing, they get, they're, they're get, getting to see the final product. And what you don't see is like the massive amount of hard work that goes into it. So people need to have this realistic knowledge that like, they need to bust their ass so hard and it's going to be grueling and it's going to be not glamorous and it's going to be really hard for a long time before you even get close to that time, that area of success. Like you said with Steve Cohen, you know, we, we, see, we, we see the success story and we don't often see about Steve going broke, mortgaging his house, risking everything, probably having his wife think he's crazy, you know, uh, all these huge risks and these, these dangerous things you do in order to achieve that success, that's all part of it, you know, and I think... Brian's uh, notes about goal setting is, is crucial, and uh, you know uh, I, I'm a big believer. And if you really want it, you can't let give yourself a fallback. It's kind of all or nothing, and and you'll 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 figure it out if my, you have no uh, other choice. And, this uh, is interesting. The point about my story was uh, I'm, this is when, when I really wanted to be a performer in magic. Uh, it was it was my deadline was when I was 18. And that's why I started really young and really fast because I, I, re I realized that if I was to go the traditional route of going to college, I did not, uh, or become a doctor, become a lawyer, become whatever, uh, I had to like have a real job or something. I felt like uh, by the time I was 18 or I had to go to, I had to figure something out by then or I had to go the traditional route. And the traditional route meant going to college. And at that point, I was uh, already working in various respects. I was doing shows. I was... Uh, you know, running a website at the time. Uh, this was before Theory 11. This was when I was 18. So that I, I kind of put a, a deadline on it for me. Like I've got to get my act together, not literally act together, but my personal act together by the time I'm 18. Or I've got to go traditional route. I've got to go to college. I've got to become a lawyer, and then magic's going to be a plan B. I did not want that to happen. I did not have a plan B. So I had until. You know, when I was 13 to 18, I had five years to figure this thing out and, and put something together. I think that's what also lit some fuel under me. So I had a deadline um, for it, and and it kind of lit everything up. So every day was is, was crucial because I had five years to figure something out, and and that was my life. This was not a, a game. It was not something fun. It's what I wanted to do forever. Can um, I uh, throw in uh, something from both questions? Uh, sure. Talking about um, finding your your persona, and then also when you're 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 achieving your goal, it it really boils down to performing a lot. You know, getting getting out there. You can develop your persona. You can also figure out how you want to be as a performer, as far as what your goals are. And a lot of times we get the question, well, how can I get shows? How do how do I do shows? And uh, here's uh, an outlet that you can do it. Uh, the SAM has the Veterans Program where we coordinate volunteer shows at VA hospitals and, and things like that, and we can help you set up the shows. They're happy to have the shows. They're great shows. It's great experience, and it's, it's, it's a win-win. They get entertainment, and you get experience. So it's, it's a really cool uh, kind of program that we have, and 
and, and, folks and doing yeah, and doing shows often. I mean, I I, I used to do shows at a uh, restaurants for you know walking up to tables and and doing things like that, performing for friends, obviously as much as I possibly could because I knew the few good advice um, notes that I had from the time. My mentor since I was 13 was Chris Kenner, and um, he would give me advice, and his his advice was. You know, don't isolate yourself to the magic community. Realize you need to be bigger. So, you know, I, I never entered myself in uh, magic competitions and stuff like that at, at conventions, um, or put a lot of emphasis on that because I wanted to, you know, I, I wanted to be a performer well outside of the magic industry, um, and I wanted to create a reputation for myself. So I did that, and uh, I, I performed a lot. He, I mean, Chris's advice to me when I was really young was, you have to perform an unbelievable amount. To have any level of, of experience or polish on your show, and if you go see Copperfield show today, it's a living testament to that. Like you know, this it's just polished to an unbelievable degree. If David's going to have someone sign something, uh, a, a specter up on stage, his hand goes like this, and a sharpie just you know is placed in his hand. So that show is choreographed to the second, like unbelievable clockwork. Jason can testify to this because Jason's brother Zach uh, works. Uh, for the show for for Copperfield, um, and, it, and that that's just practice and rehearsals and rehearsals and rehearsals and rehearsals of rehearsals until you know something gets put in the show, but not obsessing over it too much, where you never do anything. Like you have to actually do. Eventually, you're gonna have to take the risk. Eventually, even if you're you know uh, performing at a birthday party or you're Copperfield, eventually you can only rehearse so much, you can only practice so much, and then you just have to do something. And people are asking in the comments here, how important is a support structure? Uh, for me, it was important to have a, um, you know, my parents were supportive of what I was doing um, to a degree. I think I was really young then, so it wasn't, it was just like, oh, that's fun, magic's nice, yeah. Uh, but I don't know if it was, if I would have gotten that same thing if I was, you know, older and saying that this is what I want to do with my life. Um, well, I, uh, you know, growing up, my parents always said, you know, do whatever you love, do whatever makes you happy. And so I just grew up assuming that's what everyone's parents said, like, oh, of course, mom is gonna, just going to say that, whatever. But then when I got married and said, yeah, I, I want to quit my job to do magic for a while, all of a sudden I realized that not everyone's parents says that, you know, <laughs> uh, they're like her parents, I, I believe the phrase at one point, like uh, Bonnie's mom was just indignant. She was like, well, I, I thought when you got married and he was going to be working at Dell and... I think he married you under false pretenses, and uh, and it was like it was a it was a problem. There was tension until uh, until I did the Tonight Show, and then they were so proud of their son-in-law. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, man, it's like not everyone has that support. I found out. I was at uh, I went to the uh, I have season tickets to the Jets, which is a, kind of a miserable experience. But um, at the game, the there was the the people sitting behind me. It was a father and. Uh, his nephew and his uh, niece, the, but they, they were like my age, and the, and the uh, I guess it wasn't the father, but anyway, he had hit the tailgating pretty hard, and he was trying to set me up with his, his niece, and then he asked me, what do I do for a living, and I said, a magician, and he goes, okay, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Just ended it right there. <laughs> well, and that was uh, like uh, my friend C.J. Johnson, my, my business mentor, he, uh, he said that uh, the very first thing his, uh, you know, his, his now wife uh, when she mentioned, you know, that, that she's dating this guy who's a magician, first words out of her dad's mouth were like, oh, they have a great uh, retirement plan. I mean, it's like, uh, I don't know, man. It's, at the same time, obviously, everyone, everyone in this story turned out all right. So screw you, haters. There's a, uh, a good question, Brian, that is relevant to you cause, uh, and to me especially. Uh, someone's asking, uh, Bunny Chase 3 in YouTube saying, I've been asked to create a magic club at my school, but I don't like the idea of teaching secrets. What would you suggest that I do? My response on this would be you know, the same as our ethos behind Theory 11. In order for magic to advance, we need new life and interest into magic. And that goes for the SAM, that goes for Theory 11, trying to inspire a new generation of magicians and the next generation performers and creators. Um, and, uh, and, and, and also, individually, 
to advance yourself as a performer, you have to communicate. You have to share ideas with someone. So this person uh, on, on YouTube is asking if, if it's okay to create a magic club in their school. That would have been the best thing in the world for me. I would have loved that when I was a kid. If I had someone else that like I didn't have to like bribe to watch this trick for the eighth time when I was practicing it. So if you, you have the ability or someone else around you, a friend that you can get interested in magic and to collaborate with and share ideas with and practice things on, that's incredible. So I would absolutely say go for it. Did you have and, and, well, and I'll say I'll say this much. The the best year for me learning magic was was the years that I um uh that I worked at and taught magic at uh Camp Island Lake Sports and Arts Center uh up in the Pocono Mountains for two years during uh during the summer. They had a fantastic magic program. Uh I got to be a counselor one year and teach classes. I you know, and I was only I was only eight months into my magic career and here I was teaching magic to kids and nothing, nothing galvanizes the, uh, your, your, you know, your skills, like having to demonstrate them and, and teach them to other people. I mean, the, the real treat for you as the teacher is that you're going to learn a crap ton more magic that way. Uh, as far as like, you know, I don't want to teach secrets or whatever, you know, you got to, I would really encourage you to ask yourself is, is it that, that you think you're, protecting the art by reducing the number of people who love it like you do or is it that you I, I many other people probably not you but many other people say that and it's clear upon talking to them that what they really don't want is to they they, they don't want to lose being special and if they feel they feel like if now there's three magicians in their grade or five magicians in their grade somehow they're not the magic guy anymore and that's not the way it works man the more the the more people you have doing a thing doing an art the better the art does and the better it's 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 appreciated by by all when david copperfield comes to austin the first 50 tickets sold will go to the magicians in Austin. And that's what is good for magic to have more people doing magic. Yeah. Hey, JB, there's a, there's a pilot program going on in the SAM for colleges right now. And, and it's not being done by, you know, geezers in the SAM. It's, it's a bunch of kids that are... Wilder. <laughs> <laughs> in still in no, college. It, it, it's kids that are in college right now and some that have just graduated that are putting together this program. And, you know, we're trying to do it from, uh, you know, keeping in mind the economics of a, a college student and the, the social aspects of, of, a, of a college student. So we're, we're trying to address that because it's, like Brian said, it's, it's, you need to have a group of people uh, uh, to bounce stuff off of and, and foster that um, to uh, I know Justin Willman, your battery is about to die on your laptop, so I want to get uh, a few more questions in. We're going to wrap up this whole thing in a few moments, so I'm getting a few more viewer questions in. If you guys are watching this live now on YouTube and not recorded, you can post your uh, questions in the YouTube comments below uh, this video if we're still live, and uh, we'll be glad to get to a few more questions here over the next few minutes. Here's a good question. Justin, if you can kick this off. The guy is asking this specifically to Jason England, but Justin, you can kick this off. How long were you practicing until you got to the skill level when you were at, somewhere around where you're at now? I guess, I, I think the root of his question is, how long did it take you to get, like, good? Or how long did it take you to get decent? Um, up, up to that point where you, you felt like you were no longer, you know, uh, you know a neophyte in magic and you were actually experienced enough to helm a show? Or is that a perpetual process? You know, for me, that I think probably be very different than Jason's answer because I, what, my, my show isn't uh, as technically demanding. I'm not really a technician. I'm, I'm, my sleight of hand is basic. I'm more of a showman. So I think my technical skills that I do right now, the card moves, the, the slights, are things that I learned in high school. And, and then after that, I took those, and then it was just a matter of two decades of learning how to be a showman and an entertainer. So technically, uh, my, my magic skills, you know, uh, you know, four or five years of practice, but then my performance skills, I've been doing it 20 years right now, and, and that's how long it takes to get where you know, where I feel like I am now, and in a year I'll be where I want to be then. I think that's a constant evolution for me. In, in, your, sure. in, in your inspirations along the way there were not just from magic. They were, I mean, isn't your, one of your mentors, Mark Summers, and in, in, in television hosts? Yeah, and just, yeah, Mark Summers and Johnny Carson and Jay Leno and Conan O'Brien and Jimmy Fallon. I mean, think, I think people who, who are just great entertainers and, you know, and, and magic 
or music or comedy, whatever people use to be the context for their entertainment. It's, it's people like that that I look up to. People like Steve Martin, you know, who it's just a little bit of everything in, in, in terms of putting on a show. That's that. Those are my heroes for sure. Um, Jason, the original question there was was addressed to you. So if you can chime in on that, of how long did it take you uh, when you were practicing to get to any reasonable level of skill, a, a solid skill level? Maybe not exactly what you're at today, but until I guess you would regard yourself as decent or good. What was that journey and that process like? Um, <clears throat> well, I'll tell you. For me, it was probably a little longer than. Um, than for someone else because of what my interests were. You know, very, very early on, I bought uh, the the Vernon Chronicles, uh, the books published by Stephen Minch. Um, uh, they came out in the late 1980s, 86 or 87 for the first Vernon Chronicles. And I read all three of those books very close together, all within a period of, you know, three or four weeks. And the truth is I didn't understand most of it uh, at the time because they're pretty deep books. To this day, they're pretty deep books. Um, but in reading those books, I realized that Vernon kept talking about these gamblers that he had seen that could do these unbelievable miracles with playing cards. And so I, you know, I'm reading these things going, God, i gotta, I got to track down these gamblers. This sounds fantastic. And so I started looking into um, the techniques of Richard Turner, uh, Steve Forty, uh, Gary Plants um, from... Uh, then West Virginia, now Houston, was a big early influence on me, Darwin Ortiz. So uh, I don't know why, but for whatever reason, I kind of gravitated to some of the toughest stuff out there with playing cards. Um, and so for me, I didn't feel comfortable doing shows until, you know, I'd probably been um, practicing for, for six or seven years. But it was because the stuff that I kind of set my sights on were pretty tough. Um, if I had set my sights on just being uh, a competent, working close-up magician, I think I could have done it in three or four years. Now, obviously, you know, I mean, I've been practicing the whole time we've been talking. Um, you know, so as far as I'm concerned, that pursuit of excellence, there's always something, you know, a little bit further down the path. And uh, JP, I know you spent time with a, a guy that um, was a huge influence on me and still is, Steve Forty. Um, and here's a guy that I've watched literally for hundreds of hours in the past six or seven years. Hundreds of hours over in his house, out to dinner somewhere, out to breakfast. Um, and during Magic Live, uh, back a month ago, I had a five-hour session with him, Bill Malone, Paul Wilson, a couple other guys, Dennis Bear, Jack Carpenter. And I saw four or five things I'd never seen him do before. Um, and these are not easy things. I mean, things where I was genuinely confused. And I'll tell you what, it's really hard to confuse me with a deck of cards. Um, but Ford, he pulls these things out of his past, and he goes, oh, here's something I want a million dollars worth. Well, let's check this out. And, you know, you watch it, and you're, you know, my head explodes again. So I'm like that little kid all over again. And... Um, and so I look at this stuff and I think, Jesus Christ, I'm never going to get there because I keep finding these things that require more and more hours. And so I'm, you know, I really like learning that stuff. Um, so the personal pursuit of excellence, I don't think will ever stop until I drop dead. But that's different from when am I, uh, for lack of a better term, allowed to start doing shows for the public without making a fool of myself and without making the rest of magicdom look bad. I think it's different for everyone, magicdom. but you know, I, I don't think you need to be doing shows if you've been practicing magic for six weeks. You certainly don't need to hang a shingle or rent a theater in Charleston, South Carolina or anything like that, uh, because those things tend to be disastrous. However, I also don't think you need to wait seven years like I did. You know, it's, it's somewhere in between. And it's going to be different for everyone. If you're doing really knuckle-busting stuff, it's probably going to lean towards the longer end of the spectrum. You really want to uh, get some practice time in because the technique is so much of a part of it. If, on the other hand, you're doing um, magic that methodologically isn't that difficult but that requires a lot of you in there, a lot of personality, you know, um, some of the stuff Matt King does is – you know, is almost self-working, not all of it, don't get me wrong, but some of the stuff he does is 
almost self-working from a methodological standpoint, but being Matt King takes years, you know, and, and you know, to develop a, a stage persona like that. So I think it kind of depends on where you've set your sights, who you want to perform for, what type of magician you're going to call yourself now versus the type of magician you want to be five years down the road, ten years down the road, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, Justin, what's your battery life at right now? <laughs> hey, can you hear me? I might be muted. I'm at 1%. Nice. Okay. So 1%. Perfect I'm here, though. Perfect timing. I wanted, I wanted to wrap this up before oh, you're... Jason, Jason worded it. Yeah, you, Jason, you worded that very well, the Matt King metaphor. That was nice. Um, I just wanted to, to you know, wrap this up before you, Justin, your battery dies and you're forced to eject yourself. Um, but uh, this, was, this, this was great. I hope that you guys watching this on YouTube, we got to a good number of questions. We had a, some very good substantive questions. So it wasn't about the quantity of questions as much as hopefully the quality of questions this go around. Um, but this was great. This was our third or so panel that we've done like this. We're going to do another one next month. Uh, in October, the same date on the 11th at 11 p.m. with a different panel and uh, and take more questions. So definitely tune in next time. And, and before I go, I wanted to thank, uh, first and foremost, uh, Vinnie Grasso um, on this because the whole genesis of this idea of getting magicians together uh, came from the SAM and it came from a conversation I had with Vinnie Grasso of how to bring uh, the next generation of magicians together, especially an eclectic spectrum of magicians like are on this right now. So thank you to Vinny and to the SAM, and we just lost uh, Justin Wilman. Um, and uh, and then next, uh, obviously, thank you to uh, Brian and to Jason. These were both uh, uh, amazing insight that you guys offered onto you from totally different perspectives. Uh, you guys have very little in common be beyond your dashing good looks and hairstyle. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> I, I guess that, that I wasn't included in that, huh? I, clearly not. <laughs> <laughs> no, right, JV, thank you for uh, putting all this together. I mean, all, all of these things, you've done so much work putting it together and moderating it really well. So you're it's, doing a it's, it's, it. it's, I think it's, it's you know, for, for me, it's, it's inspiring to, to just to hear from you guys like you and uh, Jason and Brian and Justin. And in the past, we've had... Uh, Steve Cohen was on the previous ones. Uh, Chris Kenner, um, Kayla Morelli, Dan White. I'll tell you what, so. man, you're pulling out all the all stars, and then for some yeah. reason keep inviting me. <laughs> How do you think I feel? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I mean the goal is for us to continue to do this and to uh, and to bring in a new group every month. If there's any specific requests for who you'd like to see on the show uh, here, this live event next month, please write them in the comments now before you forget. Uh, who would you like to see? Who would you like to get advice from? Is there a specific type of magician? We haven't had a mentalist, I don't think, on here before. So if we were to get someone like a, a Michael Weber or a someone uh, bringing in some, some perspective from different sides than we've already expressed before, that would be very interesting. Um, if there's any special requests, definitely write them in. Um, and, uh, and thanks to, to Brian. You've been on, uh, I think, every single one of these alongside myself and, uh, and Vinny. So it's definitely appreciated helping to not only offer insight, but uh, helping to moderate these things, too, and keep the discussion going. <laughs> right on, man. And well, making us look bad by your video quality being better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some, somehow. And, uh, and yeah, Jason, thanks, thanks again for doing this on this one. I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone that's watching this that it's really great insight talking about your story, to how you got started. Um, it's, it's interesting to me hearing someone that on a technical ability uh, is you know, a level so high and hearing how you, someone goes from nothing to that was interesting of hearing your 17-year story before you started performing like that. So I hope that was of, of interest and, and inspiration to people watching this. And uh, I think that is also thank you guys. Actually, last but not least, I shouldn't leave this without thanking you guys for watching this and for posting questions. And please uh, give us any comments, any suggestions for the next round, anyone you'd like to hear from. And, uh, and thanks for watching. We'll talk to you guys soon. Peace.